Thanks. Hi, I am Councilwoman Deborah Stark from District 3, and this is District 3. Welcome to the district. Um, we're going to do a budget presentation today. Today is our turn to listen to um, our residents about things that they care about and want to see, and, and anything you say, we actually will then put it into our evaluation as we go forward in improving our budget. Karen Peters is here from the city manager's office, and she'll help assist me today. Um, Karen, did you, I'm sorry, I know you literally just got here, I'm sorry. Did you want to kind of walk through what we do? We have a couple presentations, and then we'll take speaker cards, call people up on the issues that you want to talk about. But I'm going to turn it over to Karen Peters. Sure. Peters. Thank you, Councilwoman, and good morning, everyone. I am Karen Peters of Deputy City Manager and very happy to be here this morning with you. Um, this is, of course, one of our series of community budget meetings where we talk about the trial budget that is proposed and get input from the community so that we can take it back and revise and then talk to the council about what the community has expressed. Um, this is being recorded. Uh, we are on channel 11 and also on uh, the city's website so when you do speak um, please speak into the microphones so that uh, your your comments are recorded um, is there an interpreter here this morning okay sir can you in introduce yourself please Buenos días. Si alguien necesita servicios de interpretación, con gusto les podemos ayudar. Gracias. Thank you. Um, so, um, what we do here this morning is uh, get input from the community for our budget. This is one of 15 hearings between now and April 17th. Each meeting is similar. They're just held in, similar, in different parts of town. If you would like to provide comments, there are speaker cards at the back table, um, and uh, we'll, we'll bring them up here and, and call you when, when it's your turn to speak. But before we do that, um, we do have a couple of informational uh, videos to show you. The first one has to do with our budget process, how it is that we put a budget together. And that takes about uh, five or six minutes. And then we'll uh, have another bit video that talks specifically about the budget that's proposed for this year. Um, so we'll, we'll be taking your feedback after both of those videos. Um, but uh, before we start that, I'll ask Deborah if she has any additional comments before we run, the, run it. Go ahead. Uh, yes, thanks. Uh, in addition, uh, I'm not a morning person, so I apologize. So I, <laughs> I usually sleep into seven, so this, this is, I'm forgetting a lot of things. And one of the things I'm forgetting is to introduce Tony Matola from the mayor's office. So the mayor does have um, representation at all the budget hearings, and we're glad to have Tony. I am because he's a resident of District 3. It was probably an easy drive for you to come over. So um, if you have any concerns regarding the mayor's office, Tony's here as well. So with that, why don't we start the presentation? Let's talk about the City of Phoenix budget. But wait, 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 don't go anywhere. We're gonna make this quick and interesting. Did you know that last year, 1.5 tons of broccoli were served at Phoenix Senior Centers? And city vehicles like these garbage trucks traveled 2.9 million miles. That's equal to 119 times around the earth. Can't forget about our furry friends, the city's trained police and fire dogs. Their job is to sniff out the bad guys and find evidence. Last year, they ate 24,000 pounds of food to stay strong. So what does any of this have to do with the city budget? Everything. The Phoenix budget is around $4 billion and pays for lots of services that make your life better, safer, and more convenient. It's a huge effort made up of lots of smaller pieces, the programs and people that it takes to get the job done. So how those pieces fit together, the people, the buildings, the vehicles and equipment gets us to the total city budget. Explaining how it works isn't always easy. Managing every item in a budget with over 400 different services 
provided by over 14,000 employees, is a year-round project, one we work on every day. And it's you, the residents of Phoenix, who we have to thank for giving us a budget to balance. The bottom line is that we get revenue, taxes and fees for specific services and grants that we spend on the cost of services. That's city employees, buildings, equipment, contracts, and supplies. Here's how we get revenue to pay for important city services. For example, when you eat at a restaurant, shop in a store, fill up the tank, fly out of Sky Harbor, or pay your property taxes or your water and trash bill. That all helps to pay for things like fire and police, paving roads, new bike lanes, more library books, street lights, clean water, parks and trails, just to name a few. To provide these important services, we divide our work and track our costs through 36 city departments and functions like police, fire, parks, libraries, neighborhood services, water and aviation, and our support services like the city clerk, human resources, finance, budget, and information technology departments. Like clockwork, every spring, departments look at what it takes to provide the services for the year. Did employees leave or did new staff join the team? Are there needed or unplanned building or equipment repairs? What will broccoli cost next year? Are there new projects that need to be considered? Okay, we talked about broccoli. Now let's talk about pie. Every department gets a slice or at least a sliver of the pie. And most departments like police, fire, libraries, parks, neighborhood services, and human services are supported by the general fund. It's a pot of money that comes from these areas, general sales and property taxes, revenue distributed by the state from income, state sales and vehicle taxes, and some fines and fees. The general fund is a little less than a third of the entire budget because it pays for services that everyone needs like public safety, senior and youth programs, neighborhoods and libraries, it's the part that gets the most of the public's attention. Now, check out this slice. It's a little more than a third, and it's called enterprise funds. Think business revenue. This slice is from those departments that only charge the people who use their services directly. For example, airlines and passengers at the airport, conventioneers, water and sewer users, and customers who pay for trash pickup and recycling. And the last slice is called special revenue funds. That's the last third of the budget. This is funding that comes from taxes dedicated for a special purpose. For example, Phoenix Parks and Preserves, Transportation 2050 for Streets and Transit, and the special dedicated sales taxes for police and fire hiring. Now, to get the budget to the next step, first we take a look at what we think it'll cost to provide our services next year looking at salaries and benefits for the employees in each area. That's about 80% of our general fund budget, as well as other costs like replacing equipment and paying for gas, electricity, computers, and supplies. Then we estimate how much revenue we will take in through taxes, fees, and grants. By law, we have to make the revenue and expenses match. That's called a balanced budget. If there's not enough, we ask how to cut back. But if there's more revenue than expenses, we ask how it should be spent. It's the same process for general funds, enterprise funds, and special revenue funds. That asking is called the trial budget. It's a list of proposals from the city manager and staff based on what they have heard from the city council and the community. It's a trial budget because it's not final. It's a starting place to hear from you. The trial budget is discussed with the city council, and then we come to you. Every resident of Phoenix, yes, all 1.6 million of you, are invited to tell us what you think. You can attend a meeting and give your feedback there, or read the trial budget online and give feedback that way. Based on what you tell us, the budget is revised and presented to the city council for a second round of discussion and feedback. And then the final budget is developed and presented for the city council to formally adopt. That means when July 1st rolls around, broccoli can be served and trucks can roll through the city. Departments know how much funding they have. Remember the pie? But they have to live within their means and use only the slice they've been given. 
What happens next? A new year of work. The budget process for the following year starts and we do it all again. Managing and balancing the budget is a big responsibility and we are glad to have you be part of it every year. And now, the City of Phoenix 2018-2019 trial budget. Last year, we projected a potential budget deficit for 2018-19, more expenses than revenue, as high as $60 million. Thanks to strong leadership from the mayor and city council, we took early action, and now we have a balanced budget. Here's what we did. Last September, the city council voted to reduce overhead expenses. The council also acted on a new state law that allowed us to spread our public safety pension payments over 25 years instead of 20 years. The city also held the line on spending, giving us a surplus fund balance to start the year. And a healthy economy kept revenues on target. All this led to a five-year forecast with our budget in balance. Now the trial budget starts with basically the same pie as last year, continuing our core services. In the general fund and dedicated revenue funds, this includes hiring firefighters and police officers, providing funding for parks, streets, transit, libraries, senior centers, youth services, arts and culture, and neighborhood services. We also have funds to replace aging vehicles, especially police cars and fire equipment, repair buildings and facilities, and keep our computer systems up to date. And with some of the savings from last year, we funded a police and fire pension reserve fund to help pay any unexpected future changes in their pension costs. The trial budget includes $2.7 million in proposed enterprise and special revenue fund additions to keep pace with growth and workload demands, as well as $2.9 million in additional general funds to allocate for community services. The general fund provides support for basic services across the city, like police and fire staffing, park and library operations, and programs for youth and seniors. Let's walk through each area. First, the general fund. Public safety has the highest priority in our budget, with over 70% of our general fund going to police, fire, prosecutors, court system, and emergency management. In the trial budget, the proposal is speed up processing of the more than 77,000 police public records requests received each year by reallocating current resources. In addition, the police department will add resources for crime scene investigation. Adding five new positions will help officers locate and apprehend violent offenders possessing guns. The addition of eight fire protection positions to support the city's building inspection program and ensure properties throughout the city comply with fire safety laws and standards. And we're budgeted to continue hiring police officers and firefighters. The trial budget includes a $6 million general fund set aside and related grant support to keep fires filled staffing level at 1,654 positions for the next three years. Reducing the impacts of homelessness in Phoenix is a priority. With a nearly 60% increase in unsheltered homeless, the goal of the city is lead with services by connecting individuals experiencing homelessness with appropriate services while reducing Reducing the impact on Phoenix neighborhoods. The PHX CARES Community Action Response Engagement Services Initiative saw more than 1,000 calls for outreach and engagement in the first three months. As part of the new PHX CARES initiative, the proposed budget provides for additions across human services, neighborhood services, and parks and recreation, including the addition of two more contracted homeless outreach teams to increase the city's caseload capacity by 360 clients per year and continuing to lead with services. Parks and Recreation will add two ranger positions to provide direct outreach to people needing services in the city's urban park system. This brings our total number of rangers to 79. 
adding two positions to coordinate client service referrals, improve response times, and ensure coordination of efforts by all city departments to address code violations that arise from encampments. Phoenix continues its investment in neighborhood livability in this year's proposed budget with these proposed additions. Add five enforcement staff in the Neighborhood Services Department for a new Sober Living Home Licensing Program. The purpose of this program is to enhance the health, safety, and welfare of residents of structured sober living homes and the surrounding community by establishing standards and regulations for the homes and their operators. As part of program administration, the City Clerk Department also will add two licensing positions to process and oversee applications funded through licensing fees. Increasing shade and replacing trees citywide with $450,000 to plant 750 trees annually and provide water and maintenance for them to thrive. This is also part of the city's tree and shade master plan. Additionally, the Office of Arts and Culture is proposed to receive an additional $30,000 in funds to increase grant funding for Phoenix Arts and Culture organizations to pre-recession levels. There is also funding for a project manager tasked with developing a Latino cultural center in the city of Phoenix. And for our libraries, continuing to restore hours for the community. This proposal makes Sunday hours permanent at four libraries, Yucca, Century, Harmon, and Acatillo. Lastly, the budget provides for funding to support outreach for the 2020 census to make sure all residents participate and get counted and the staff needed to oversee the city's involvement with the census count. Now for the non-general fund piece of the pie. Remember, this funding comes from dedicated fees and charges to customers, like development fees from companies that must pay for construction-related services provided by the city. The Planning and Development Department will use this revenue to add 18 positions, handling everything from plan review and site inspections to mapping, long-term planning, and more frontline staff for customer service assistance. Additionally, the Street Transportation Department will use special revenue funds to add 30 positions at a cost of $859,000 to improve our streets and support the paving maintenance and traffic improvements as well as traffic signal electricians, transportation 2050 related bicycle and pedestrian infrastructure development and maintenance, and employees to oversee the city's pavement plan, street sweeping, and proper implementation of Americans with Disabilities Act required projects. Altogether, these pieces of the pie do more than describe the work our city departments will do in the coming year. They tell the story of Phoenix's continued growth to be the fifth largest city in the country with a diverse and thriving economy and a community that's in demand as a great place to live, work, and play. Thanks for taking the time to learn about the 2018-19 City of Phoenix trial budget. And please don't forget, this year's budget hasn't been adopted just yet. Your input is important, and the City of Phoenix wants to hear from you on what the upcoming budget should look like. Make sure you pick up a budget pamphlet outlining all the proposals and options at any of the public meetings or online at phoenix.gov budget. You can also send your comments or questions to budget.research at phoenix.gov or to reach us by phone, call 602-262-4800. You can also comment on social media by using hashtag Phoenix Budget. Thank you for participating in this important process. Okay, um, so first I wanna thank all of the city staff that are here this morning and acknowledge um, uh, we have a lot of city departments. So the residents that are here, if you have any specific questions, there is likely a department staffer here who can answer. So uh, please, please, uh, please articulate your questions. We're, we're happy, to, happy to answer those. Again, the speaker cards are in the back. We have a few. Uh, Deborah's gonna get that started and uh, speakers will come to the microphone here. So with that, 
here we go. Thank you. So we have <clears throat> one gentleman who does not wish to speak, but I'm going to go ahead and put what he wrote here on the record. Keith Slattery. And he says, since 2010, the Phoenix Fire Department has seen, um, I can't read your writing, an increase of 50,000 calls per year with no increase in firefighters, trucks, or stations to meet the needs of our citizens. We need 138 new firefighter positions. So thank you for that. Um, the first speaker is Dana Medlin. Am I pronouncing that correctly, Dana? I'm sorry. <laughs> I'm not great at names. That's what the mayor does so well. If he were here, <laughs> if he were here, he could. Uh, okay. <laughs> Thank you for being here. Thank you. Um, I'm actually going to piggyback on the last comment you made. My name is Dana Medlin. I worked for the city of Phoenix for 21 years as a firefighter. I've worked mostly in District 3. And today, I just want to talk to you a little bit about uh, our staffing levels. Um, I'm here to ask, tonight to ask our leaders to increase staffing and resources for the Phoenix Fire Department. We're asking for a plan. During the recession, our firefighters were asked to do more with less, and we may continue sacrifices to maintain the excellent customer service that you guys deserve. Um, the temporary measures designed to survive the budget cuts um, 10 years ago created a scenario with understaffed fire stations um, and firefighters, lack of resources to protect the city and the citizens of Phoenix. Since 2010, as Keith mentioned, we've seen an increase in 50,000 calls, a trend of 6,500 calls per year. Uh, this increase comes without staffing or new fire or increased number of fire trucks. 45% or almost half of the fire trucks in the city of Phoenix respond to over 3,000 calls per year. This falls in a national category through the NFPA of, of very high or critical response times. What that means to you is when those trucks are out more than 3,000 times a year, you're not getting your closest fire truck. You might live next door to a fire station, but that station is probably out responding to other calls. You're gonna get one that is double the amount of time away or even triple the amount of time away. Um, Engine 7, which is in District 3, responded to 5,410 calls last year in the top 1% of all fire stations in the United States, one of the busiest trucks that the United States has. Give you a little information just about District 3, which is our district we're in here. We have six stations, seven fire engines, two ladders, and three rescues, which are ambulances. NFPA 1710 requires a standard response time of five minutes and 20 seconds. That's from the time the call comes into our dispatch center. Police gives it over to the fire department dispatch center. We get on the truck, we respond, and come to your front door. Three out of the nine, or 33% of the um, fire companies in this district did not meet that standard last year. Um, again, when a company responds to over 3,000 calls, that's considered very high and causes what's called overlap or secondary responses. Eight of the nine tr um, trucks, or 89% of this uh, fire engines and fire apparatus in this district ran over 3,000 calls last year. Again, with Station 7 being the busiest and one of the busiest in the country. Total calls in the District 3 last year were 32,163, 17% of the entire city's response. Again, challenges in just this district are extremely high vo call volumes, which causes the secondary uh, responses, so prolonged response times. Um, we have areas to the north of us that have no fire stations that um, need coverage, so those trucks are being drawn to the north. We have Station 18, which is the busiest fire station in the United States at 23rd Avenue and Camelback, just to the south of this district, um, which has five fire apparatus, and all of them are over 4,000 calls per year. So those car companies in District 3 are getting drawn into that area as well. Um, so with uh, the reality of is so many fire trucks going to this many emergencies, probably you aren't getting the closest fire truck to your emergency, which are heart attacks, strokes, car accidents, fires. These things are critical as far as times are considered. That's why the standard is five minutes and 20 seconds. We're not getting to them as we would like to. Um, the number in Fire trucks and stations has not increased. We've gone from 1.4 million to close to 1.7 million people since 2010. Um, our needs is to add 138 fire personnel. That'll give us five new fire apparatus to put around the city to increase our response times and our uh, take care of the gaps in coverage. Um, this will get us to the minimum national standard of 1710, NFPA, which is National Fire Protection Association, 1710 of one firefighter per 1,000 people. Um, this will ensure the better response times to our citizens that you deserve. 
Again, this is not about the firefighters. We're not asking for anything other than to get more people to help respond to the calls and to serve the citizens of Phoenix. Thank you. Thank you. Our next speaker is Franklin Marino. Good morning, and thank you for allowing me to speak. For the record, my name is Franklin Marino, and I'm going to speak from three different perspectives. First and foremost, I'm a resident of the city. I actually live in District 2, and my wife and I own a home. We pay taxes. I'm a city employee. I'm a 24-year veteran of the Phoenix Police Department, and I spent the majority of my career in patrol as a first responder, answering calls for service when people call 911 or Crime Stop, so I know what it's like to be a street cop. I currently serve as the secretary of the Phoenix Law Enforcement Association, PLEA, the union that represents approximately 2,400 rank and file Phoenix police officers and detectives, the men and women that do the hard, heavy lifting every day for the citizens of Phoenix. Now, we've heard all about growth, we've heard all about how we're the fifth largest city in the country, but the reason I'm here, and I'm going to piggyback on what Dana said, public safety is still behind the power curve. The police department is down hundreds of positions because the city didn't hire cops for six years. Now, we finally started hiring again, but the damage has been done. Detective bureaus. Shortly after Chief Williams took over the department, she was forced to reduce and gut investigative and specialty details to put people back in patrol because patrol had been so severely understaffed. So that was done, but what did it do? A couple of things, domino effect. More cops on the street taking reports, fewer detectives to process and do follow up on those reports. City of 1.6 million people, and we have one detective, best of my knowledge, that handles vulnerable adult investigations. That's unacceptable. Our traffic bureau is in shambles. One of these, you heard the firefighters talking about responding to wrecks. If you've been watching the news lately, serious injury and fatal collisions are on the uptick. And one of the reasons is because we don't have traffic resources out there to conduct traffic enforcement, like running radar, stop signs, red lights. Yeah, we have traffic technology. We have photo radar cameras and red lights. But that doesn't prevent somebody from a, with a suspended license from driving. If they have interaction with a police officer, not only do they get tickets, but their vehicle gets impounded. It takes them off the streets. We've had a drop in DUI arrests because we have fewer DUI enforcement motors. And the common denominator, again, we have fewer than 40 cops on motorcycles, down from about 150 just over a decade ago. And patrol, they're too busy responding to radio calls. We don't have the time to do proactive policing like we used to. Compounding our response times, besides manpower, we have a records management system that takes officers off the street for an extended amount of time to complete their reports. We've eliminated our central booking detail as a money-saving effort. However, by eliminating central booking, which was created about a decade ago, where officers could arrest somebody, complete the booking paperwork on their computer, in their vehicle, drive to a centralized location where they could hand off the prisoner to a group of officers who would then take custody of the prisoner, fingerprint them, photograph them, take them to the jail, and then wait at the jail until the county took final custody of them. Now we don't do that anymore. Officers are forced to go back to a workstation, whether it's a precinct or a substation. They have to do the photographs and the fingerprints themselves. They have to write the report, and it takes a check of two to three phone calls before they can actually go to the jail. Then they have to sit at the jail and wait until the jail people can take custody of them. So instead of moving forwards, we're moving backwards. Again, as a result of the shortage, officers are going without backups. They're taking calls on their own. As of March 27th, 24 officer-involved shootings in the Valley. And on 12 of those alone were in Phoenix. And then on Easter Sunday, we had one more, 32nd Street in Monta Vista. Why is this? Criminals know there's fewer cops out there. They know and they're willing to take a chance that they're going to fight it out with a cop. Fortunately, our officer triumphed in that incident. Fewer cops, fewer officers arriving on scenes without backup. Now, I will tell you that the city did hire 239 officers last year. The goal is to get us up to 3125 by July 1st. But 3125 is 260 fewer than we had a decade ago. 
You mean to tell me the city hasn't grown? We haven't seen new homes, apartments, businesses? Now, out of the 239 officers, 137 total officers separated from the Phoenix Police Department last year. So that left us with a net gain of 102 officers, or 8.5 per month. We have lost a total of 985 officers since 2010. So it's time for Phoenix to act like the fifth largest city and the fastest growing city in the country and properly staff the police department. We, Phoenix Law Enforcement Association, believes that we need 2.5 officers per thousand citizens. That would give us a total sworn force of anywhere between 4,200 to 4,000 officers, which is what we need to provide top quality law enforcement service to the deserving citizens of a city that has a geographical footprint of 530 square miles. Thank you. Thank you. Um, the next speaker is Craig Tripkin. Former council member, welcome. No, I'm I'm not timing today. Do you need help? You want me to help? Sorry, that's so fragile. It's going to look like a comedy before I'm done. Uh, hi, I'm here to talk about homelessness. Um, I work uh, with Central Arizona Shelter Services, and and since we've talked a lot about this, I'm going to really cut to the chase very quickly. Um, we shelter beds are down, uh, and will be down by September about 25 percent, 27 percent total in the city of Phoenix. Uh, or in the Maricopa County area. That's 382 beds. Uh, CAS holds 470 beds right now. Uh, so we are coming up on a, on a bed shortage. The real key, and, and there's, there's going to be talk of expansion, and expansion would be silly if we don't have the chance to provide the casework. Our caseworker, our casework works. Right now we have a caseworker ratio of 47 to 1. Uh, the national standard is 30 to 1. We, ha we can only get to casework with the prioritization system we have. We can only casework about 30 percent of what we actually see, of, of, of the people who qualify, not of what we actually see, but the people who qualify. We can only see about 30 percent. Uh, we have uh, an, an 85 percent positive exit, uh, known positive exits, and I have to emphasize the word known because we have some unknown exits, 85 percent known positive exits to housing or to family or whatever that we have with, with people who are intensely case, who are case worked. Uh, we, there's a lot of talk about housing and, uh, and housing is great. You know, the CBI program, outreach is, is a great thing. And if, unless they have a place to take people, uh, it's, it's not going to work, uh, or it's not going to work well. They, they've talked about how they get one out of ten people off the street. You can decide whether or not that's a good percentage or not, and I hope, I presume they've been ramping up, and I'll give them, I'll give them that. But outreach need, does need to happen. There's no question about it. Uh, and when they talk about housing people, um, they're basically using ABC vouchers and some of the REBA vouchers that are already, already in existence. They're brokering those deals. The, they're, we can lower the length of stay by about 25 percent if we have a case, if, if we could casework, let me see this right, of the people we casework, their stay is 20 percent lower. So we can uh, open up about 60 beds, and you know, that's a, that's a guess. It could be 40, it could be 100 beds. If we had the casework we could do, and then the talk of expansion would be certainly a lower number, and I think that would be better for the neighborhoods around us. Uh, Homelessness is bad for the individual, it's bad for the neighborhoods, uh, and it's bad for our community. Uh, and, and, and we need to, uh, we need to look and do, and do something about that. Uh, United Way study, like I said, showed that, I didn't say this, United Way study, the rapid rehousing study that was done last year when they got a bunch of money, showed that, um, uh, it, it said definitively that people who stay in shelter are more successful in housing. Uh, the, the, the shelter is a critical bra breathing room for a person to succeed in housing. Forget housing first, as far as I'm concerned. Taking somebody off the street and putting them right into housing, uh, they, they, need a, they need an emotional detox. They need a mental health detox, and I think shelter can offer them that. 
uh, and we see we see 5,000 people a year, and that's uh, pretty much what we've got. And I think I will uh, I think I'll wrap it up from there, except to say one thing: if we want to get homeless people off the street, we need more beds, and we need more casework, and we need to get people through our system faster. And we can do that. The numbers show that we can do that. Um, but we need, we need that. If we're going to see expansion, you're going to hear a lot of talk about expansion coming from not me, but from other people. And in order to do that, that's going to be physical plant-wise, that's going to be a $500,000 number. Uh, ca ongoing casework, uh, that's going to be roughly a $400,000 number. Um, but I think that's the way we're going to get people off the streets and out of our neighborhoods. Thank you. Thank you, Craig. Our last speaker is Linda Smith. I know, I'm, I'm surprised. <laughs> Monday I had uh, 20. I know you. <laughs> Hello, my name's Linda Smith. I've been a resident of District 3 for 43 years, I think. Um, and I always come to the budget meetings. Would have missed this one this year, however, because I got my notice yesterday. And I understand that there's been two other meetings in my district that I didn't even know were happening. I'm, I heard they were well attended, so I'm pleased about that. But So my first concept here is that having seen the city's budget process for a very long time, and having had many city council people come and go, it feels to me, because of the lack of access of information, that the city doesn't really care what the people want to say or what they are thinking, because it's a whole lot easier to run a business without complaints or additional ideas of what we should be using for funding. And that is how it feels to me anyway, because it wasn't even in the newsletter for the water bill that there were city council meetings, I mean that there were district meetings going on for the budget. It's always been in there. Now I know I'm a dinosaur because I still get a paper bill, but <laughs> nevertheless, if you're paying online, there should be an email that responds to you and tells you, because they have always put city announcements in the water bill newsletter. And I know that I've, we've had a couple of city um, council people that haven't felt that that was a useful way to distribute um, information. Does anybody read that anymore? Anybody? Is there, how many people are actual citizens and not staff here. I rest my case. <laughs> we have a half a dozen people here, and we've got enough staff to run a, a department, but not enough people to tell you what we need. So first, so that's, I think that's the number one thing. We're the fourth largest county in the nation. Maricopa County is the fourth largest county in the nation. By the way, we're running out of water but we still want to plant lots of trees and walk in the shade, maybe we should start talking about getting rid of grass and maybe golf courses don't have to have every inch of it a manicured lawn. Maybe just the greens need to be. I would really like to know that in my last decade here, I wouldn't have to move up to upstate New York because we run out of water. <laughs> so I really think water's a huge issue and the city can't affect that with the state, but we can affect it within the city. And nobody thinks about saving water. Nobody thinks about conserving water. We should be, we live in a desert. So anyway, there's so many issues that I can't even address them all. And but I just want to say that there's structurally something wrong when there's only six public here to speak, and there's 20 or 30 staff. Um, and. So that right there, I think if you could get community established again, these meetings used to be packed and everybody knew each other and we chatted before the meetings and after the meetings. I know two, of, I know one person here from, from the time I've lived here. So I think that that says a whole lot about what the city needs to do. Pull us back in. Remember, you're not a business. You're a service provider. Cities are not meant to be a for-profit business. They're meant to be a service to the community. It seems like we've got our priorities reversed. And I can't, I'm terrified at what I see with the growth. We're building like crazy. I, you can't go anywhere where you don't see new construction, yet we have all of these problems that we have no revenue for. 
I would like to see that figured out as well. We shouldn't keep extending the footprint of Phoenix if we don't have any way to pay for all the services that we need to supply. And especially, we know that if we're a fourth largest county in the nation, you're gonna have a huge homeless problem. And we've had it forever, it's never really been solved. There are just so many issues, but, uh, my, but my real love and the reason I'm here <laughs> is for the public library system. I've been a friend of the library for very many years, 30, I don't know how many more now. But it is the one service where every person can walk in off the street, gain access to the internet, and you no longer can apply for a job if you don't have internet access. You can no longer apply for almost anything. So for those people who can't afford the internet connections, the library is there one very few places that they can go to get. And they have Wi-Fi, so if you have your own computer, you can go there and do what you need to do. So I can't think of a service that's more valuable because you can educate yourself at a library if you really want to work at it. And you not only have the books as access now, they have the most amazing audiobook program and uh, that you can just download. You don't even have to go to the library. And it's free if you have a library card. Uh, so the best way in the world to educate yourself. Read, you can be doing your housework or your yard work and listening to a book. And by the time you're done, you've accomplished work and you've enlightened your brain. So can't say more about the library system. I think that uh, every city, and we do have a fine library system in the city of Phoenix. We can be proud of our library system. Uh, it's one of the best in the nation. So thank you very much. Thank you, Linda. Um, we have now an additional speaker card, John D. Oh, there you are. Hi, John. How are you doing? Let's raise this up a little bit. No, let's just do this. My name is John Dean. I'm a fire captain with the with, uh, city of Phoenix. I've been with the department for 21 years, uh, captain for 12 years, and I'm assigned to a special operations unit. So I'm uh, one of those guys that does mountain rescues and all the hazmat stuff, but I've been on, uh, I basically worked th throughout the city. I live right up the road here, uh, just off of 40th Street, and uh, I'm right on the border of uh, District 2 and 3. One of the things I want to bring up today is, is I think um, I normally come to these community meetings and I sit back and I listen to what the residents want to, would like and, and the needs. We all have needs. As, as Dana said from, with the fire department before, as gentlemen with the police department, we all have these needs and what we have is we have a little budget to try to spread around. In the video it showed that we had eight uh, uh, firefighters that, that are um, that have been, basically, we're, we're gonna hire eight people to help with some of the fire prevention. That's, that's really a reaction to an event that took place earlier this year. But in essence, we took five sworn people out of their positions, we put them back in the street. It's kind of a band-aid to the problem. What we really need here in the city is a plan. We need a, need a plan of how we're going to take care of the firefighters as far as increased staffing, increased staffing in the police department, address needs of the parks, the homeless, and that's one of the things that um, I spoke the other night at one of the meetings, and, and, and uh, Councilman Starks, we, we spoke afterwards. We all live here, as you said before. We, we need the services, but we've got to figure out a way of how we're going to provide those plans long term. 2007, we started taking budget cuts here. 2009 was huge. In the meantime, we had growth in this city that was tremendous, especially up in the north. Dana talked about the fact that about 30, about 32, 31 percent of the call volume is right up in this in this district here. I can tell you as you continue moving north, it gets slimmer and slimmer. There are times that we're out of ambulances in the north. We go into what we call a status three, where we're borrowing ambulances from downtown to come up here. Longer response times. If you look in the northwest side right now, we're we're running a. Uh, one of the fire stations, a 12-hour, it's a 12-hour station running out of a hotel to provide service in the community, an area that has been uh, hugely underprotected um, over the past several years, just because of the growth. This will continue. This will continue because as the growth continued, we were supposed to, in the last bond, have additional five fire companies that were nixed basically because of budget. Two ladder companies, three engine companies. I deal with a lot, a lot of the statistics as far as when it comes to analysis for the fire department. Um, 
and I work with our president on looking at where we should be. We are down, when we look at the numbers, we look at the NFPA standards, National Fire Protection Association standards of where we should be. We are probably, uh, uh, we have 14 ladder companies, we probably need closer to the mid 20s. I'm working on analysis right now back with Washington, look at those numbers. My engine companies were at 65. Right now, we know that we're at least five companies down in engine companies, if not more. You know, you heard the police department. I know that they are grossly understaffed. We work with them hand in hand. There's a lot of time their squads are, are, instead of having a 10 or 12 person squad, they're at six. That's delayed response times for you, just as it is for us. We have what we call automatic aid here in the Valley. All the fire departments, what we do is we share resources. We cross borders. So in essence, even though you have the city of Phoenix Fire Department, there's 26 other agencies that we share resources with. So, but we're constantly moving from place to place. We're helping them, they're helping us because of the shortage of resources. To wrap it up, I think, uh, Councilman Starks, what we need to do is we need to have a plan because I can guarantee you we'll have community meetings next year and we'll be, we'll be having these same discussions as we had last year and the year before about how we're going to take care of our city, the things that the needs that we have and how we're going to address those. And I think it's time that we work, continue working with the council that we have in the, in, the, in the city manager and the mayor and trying to find solutions to this. Um, I thank you for your time this morning and myself and I'm sure as, as the officers or anyone else that's in here that, that works for the city, we're certainly, if you want to talk to us at all, we'll, we'll be here. So thank you for your time. Thank you, John. Uh, we actually did have one question regarding the hearing schedule, and thanks for bringing that. I, I don't think you wrote it, Linda, but you spoke to it as well. We did have advertisements in the Republic at, um, March 19th and March 26th, and then in three other additional papers. Um, but certainly your comments about the water, city notes, I'm one of those dinosaurs. I still get the bill, too. You and I may be the only ones, though, but, but I, it is a valuable tool while we have it. So I thank you for bringing that up. I also want to thank everyone for being here. I appreciate the comments. I know people say it doesn't really make a difference, but I think it does, and I'm going to single out Craig. He comes to every budget hearing, and last year he spoke to the hearts of, of the council, and we did find some additional funding for CAS. I know not as much as you probably wanted, but I do want you to know that your voice does count, and we do listen. So thank you so much for being here today. I really appreciate it. Thank you.